so we'll give him an extra minute, give him 21 minutes. Um, but this is the uh, fifth and final one of this series of, uh, in the Becky 2020 series. Uh, we've endeavoured to go through uh, a number of the issues that uh, are challenging us, and this is the final one which is really looking at education in the built environment. Um, there you've got six building surveyors, I'm sure Tony will talk about this. So I took another six of those building surveyors around that very site this morning, you know, um, and there's, when was that, seven weeks ago, eight weeks ago? Oh, it was about a month ago. A month, a, month, a month ago. It's amazing how much has already happened in that site um, in, in, in the past four years. Um, but without further ado, let me hand over to Tony. Okay, thanks, Rob. Um, well, it's, it's convenient that Rob has uh, introduced me because um, this talk is really about um, the whole Becky initiative and the impact that it has on higher education, in particular uh, what we are doing to respond to the, uh, the various initiatives that are taking place. And in fact, yesterday, Rob, who is a, um, a, a tweeter, as am I, he tweeted, he's expecting fireworks from me. And uh, I was sort of put on the spot by that. He later explained that um, it's a reference to an article that was in Building Magazine um, just a couple of weeks ago uh, by the engineer Chris Wise, um, which he concluded with the words, I hope for fireworks. And as we shall see later on, because I'll actually refer to this article in my presentation, he's promoting the idea of new models for built environment education. Well, let's take it that back a little bit um, and talk about the context. If you go right back to the very first presentation in this series, this Becky series, which was by Martin, Martin explains the, um, the principles and the drivers behind the government's construction strategy. And one of the key objectives of the, the government's construction strategy is what they refer to as an integrated supply chain. And that quote is taken directly from the document. Designers and constructors work together to develop an integrated solution that best meets the required outcome. An admirable objective. I think everyone can subscribe to that. What's that got to do with the current models of built environment education that we have? Well, in order to explain why I think it's relevant, I'm going to quote you from a few reports from industry leaders and uh, from government-sponsored committees. We educate in very narrow silos. They come out of university with preconceived ideas. Courses have become too specialised, too narrowly focused on meeting the short-term industrial needs rather than educating people for a career in the built environment. And lastly, the relationship between those responsible for design and construction should be improved through common education. So there's recognition of these issues. But what's interesting is to look at when those reports were actually published. That last one came from the Banwell Report in 1964. The second one came from a report that was um, sponsored by the O'Barrick Foundation in 1998, Interdisciplinary Skills for Built Environment Professionals. And the first one I put up came from Peter Rogers when he was chair of the Strategic Forum for Construction back in 2002. So clearly there is recognition. And if you look at the built environment disciplines, if we, if we speak very broadly, obviously there is the discipline of architecture, the, the design-based disciplines. There is an overlap with the engineering disciplines. There's a whole range of disciplines concerned with technology, with the management of the production process, with the management of the commercial aspects of construction. And there are various <coughs> other built environment disciplines, those concerns with property, planning, infrastructure, with facilities management. And if you want any evidence of just how fragmented the built environment is, you only have to look at 
the Construction Industry Council. Look at the constituent bodies that make up the Construction Industry Council. Here's just a selection. This is just 12 of over 30 full members of the Construction Industry Council. The professional bodies that perhaps we most obviously recognise. Now is that a problem? Well, people do think it is a problem. A couple of years ago, the Innovation and Growth Team produced a report about low carbon construction. Paul Morell, who was at the time the government's construction advisor, was quoted as saying that it's scarcely possible that the innovation and change that is essential can be secured through the industry as it's currently structured and in the silo-based habits of the industry's institutions. That's quite a, a damning um, uh, sort of view of the structure of the industry. So throughout all of these things, what we see is constant references to specialisation, to silo mentality, to a narrow focus, to people having preconceived ideas. And as I say, it's all about this fragmentation. So I thought it would be interesting just briefly to examine how this has come about. Look at it from a historical perspective. And to understand it, you really have to go back to the 18th century, because up until that time, construction was, was largely based on a medieval model that was, was built around the, the guilds, the guilds of craftsmen. So if you were a client who wanted a, a building, you would go direct to each of the, the crafts guilds that, that were required to construct that building. So you would uh, perhaps employ um, a carpenter or a, um, you know, a, a plasterer or all of the different trades and crafts that you needed and you would employ them all directly. But in the 18th century, that model started to break down, largely because of the increasing need for more complex buildings. And so what we started to see was the increasing use of an intermediary who sat between the, uh, the client and the various craftsmen and tradesmen. Now initially, that intermediary would have been a master craftsman. But gradually, the role of the architect in this intermediary position started to sort of take hold. If you move into the 19th century, there were, as buildings became even more complex, uh, very, very complex military buildings were required. The Industrial Revolution produced the need for factories and mills and, uh, and so on. And so the role of the architect took on even more importance and there was an increasing separation between the design function and the construction function. And as methods of procurement started to change, there was the emergence of what was initially known as the, the measurer, the forerunner to today's quantity surveyor. And we also saw the growth of general contracting. So rather than having to, to deal separately with um, each of the different trades, a general con contractor would take on that role and would employ them as subcontractors. But what's particularly significant during this period is the establishment of professional institutions. And it was really during this period, the early and, and towards the sort of latter half of the 19th century, that these gentlemen's clubs, because essentially that's what they started as gentlemen's clubs in London, um, to share ideas, to, um, to, to network, as we would call it today, um, sometimes as study, uh, study uh, organisations. But you can see where they emerge from. The Institution of Civil Engineers still carries that title. 1834, the Institute of British Architects, now the RIDA. 1834 also, the Builders Society, which is now the Charles Institute of Building. And 1868, the Institution of Surveyors, which is now the RICS. So in effect, from that point on, this fragmentation became institutionalised, fixed within the industry. So there was a, a degree of, uh, I suppose, protectionism, because everyone's trying to you know, put boundaries around their own roles, their own professional responsibilities. How did that impact on education then? Well, to look at the, the growth of built environment education, we really need to turn to the 20th century. 
because from a very early stage, the end of the 19th and early 20th century, the disciplines of architecture and engineering became established in the universities. There were professors of architecture, professors of, say, civil engineering in the universities. So from, a, from the earliest days, these disciplines had a, uh, a seat in the, um, the, you know, the, the early universities. Contrast that, though, with the more sort of general disciplines associated with surveying and building. Because you wouldn't have found these in the late 19th century, early 20th century universities. The tradition for education in these fields was largely part-time. You learned primarily on the job, and then you, you went perhaps to evening classes, and you studied to sit professional examinations. The examinations of the Institute of Building, or the examinations of the Royal Institution of Chartered Surveyors. So they only really came to the university sector quite late in the day. It was really only in the 1970s that we started to see the emergence of degrees in building, in surveying, and so on. And, and they really only started to grow, I would suggest, during the 1990s. But throughout this entire period, what's interesting to note is that all of the disciplines, whether it's architecture and engineering in the universities or the other disciplines such as surveying and building, studying part-time, the professional bodies are exerting significant control over the curriculum that students are studying. So it's really no wonder then that by the time we get to the, the present day, we have um, a, a set of models for the various disciplines in the built environment which effectively reflect the fact, fragmented nature of the construction and built environment professions. And we still have, I would suggest, a curriculum which is heavily, heavily influenced by the professional bodies through the process of accreditation. If you want your degree course accredited, then you have to demonstrate that it fulfills the, the expectations of the, um, the professional bodies. So what's the answer then? What do we actually do about this? Well, one approach would be to acknowledge that there is considerable scope for greater commonality in the education, training, and continu continuing professional development of the construction professions. This quote was taken from another report, a report known as Crossing Boundaries, produced by Derbyshire and Andrews. It was a report on the state of commonality in the education and training of the construction professions. When was that produced? 20 years ago. That was the starting point for the investigations which led to the report. Let me just show you a couple of the findings that emerged from that report though. Firstly, there is no support for the concept of a common three-year degree for all construction professions. And perhaps saddest of all, one of the contributors to the report said this, what's the point of educating rounded people for an industry full of square adversarial roles. This was reinforced by the Latham Agenda. Everyone's heard of the Latham Report, or I suspect most people have heard of the Latham Report, a major report from the early 1990s, I think it was published in 1994. Out of the Latham Agenda, a whole bunch of working groups were established to look at different facets of the um, the, the agenda associated with the, the, the Latham Report. One of those looked at education, and it was chaired by a former dean from here, Michael Romans. He actually chaired the Working Group 9, which produced this report. This is what they concluded. Propositions which use the concept of a general built environment degree program will be viewed with skepticism by academics, and unavailable evidence will be heavily undersubscribed. So, not much hope there, then, I would suggest. So we're still stuck, then, with these built environment disciplines. And what those reports really seemed to, um, to focus on was the increasing separation, particularly between architecture and engineering. They, they suggested that there was a, a noticeable shift in schools of architecture to see um, architecture is more as, as a fine art 
And in engineering, to see it more as an applied science with an emphasis on uh, mathematics. But even if you look at the yeah. other disciplines, look at the disciplines associated with technology, with management, with the commercial aspect, look at our program here. Look at the fragmentation that exists there. We've got five separate degree courses just to cover that aspect of it. So we're not even talking about the architecture, the, all the engineering disciplines. There is really major, major fragmentation. Why? What are the barriers to this? And there are some significant barriers. Firstly, go back to the professional bodies. Of those professional bodies I listed earlier on, all of those, those circled ones, accredit degrees in this school. They all have different expectations. We have to demonstrate to the professional bodies that we are meeting those expectations. Secondly, employers. Many employers will express a preference for graduates who come from professionally accredited courses because they want their employees to become professionally qualified. Students know that, or prospective students know it. So they will be naturally attracted to professionally accredited courses because they will perceive that as providing them with better employment prospects. And that means that universities will not be particularly inclined to take any risks with the status quo because it might affect student recruitment. So does that mean we're, that we're, we're just stuck with this now? Well, possibly not. If we look ahead, there are a number of possible drivers for change. Firstly, I think learning and teaching is changing. There is a move away from traditional sort of didactic teaching towards more focus on active student learning. Students actually getting involved. There's now much less emphasis on um, just acquiring knowledge and more emphasis on creativity, on problem solving, uh, using judgment, collaborating with one another, and coping with change, coping with, with um, a constantly changing environment. So that's the first thing. Secondly, I think we have to recognise that the new tuition fee regime is going to have an impact. Students will demand more, quite rightly, if they're paying that sort of level of tuition fee. So universities will have to respond. But there are some external drivers as well. The low carbon agenda, this is the report that was produced a couple of years ago by the government. But yesterday in the budget, the government actually uh, renewed its commitment to the, the 2016 date for zero carbon for new homes. They haven't actually outlined how they're going to achieve it yet, but the, the headline commitment is there. Now, if we are going to achieve that low carbon agenda, there really will be a need for innovation. And perhaps, as Rob spoke in his presentation a few weeks ago, the whole low carbon sustainability agenda can provide a catalyst for, for new ways of working. I've already made reference to the government construction strategy, which, as said, Martin introduced in his presentation, the idea of promoting collaboration in the industry developing new procurement models, and as, as Adam said in his presentation, promoting the idea of, of an intelligent client. And of course, we have, for the first time, the technology which will really foster a, a spirit of collaboration. It will allow uh, collaboration to take place uh, much more easily, and it's becoming increasingly achievable even for small organisations. Now potentially I think that BIM could provide a, a platform for a rethink of built environment education. And that takes us back to the Chris Wise article because he talks about the need to, to defragment uh, engineering and architecture to bring well integrated contextually aware technological knowledge into play from the start of every building design. He talks about the need for a new educational model. What sort of model are we looking at? Well, I'm going to just briefly uh, show you a model that's uh, seen in an, another country 
Um, last year, myself and Colin and Virginia were fortunate enough to visit uh, Denmark, um, and we, we went to the small town of uh, Horsens in Denmark, where uh, Via University College is located. Now, they have a very interesting uh, program there that they offer. It's a degree that is delivered entirely in English to students from all over Europe, and it's a Bachelor of Architectural Technology and Construction Management. The interesting thing about it is delivered over seven semesters, one of which is spent in industry gaining experience. But the periods that are spent in the university, they don't, they don't do modules, they do projects. So in each semester, the students work in groups on one project and one project alone. It starts off with very simple domestic construction, works its way through multi-story buildings, conversions, renovations, and so on. Um, and they still have lectures, there is still theory input from the staff, but the majority of the focus of each of the projects that they do is the students working together to solve problems collaboratively. There's nothing, no, no sort of question of identifying who's the quality surveyor, who's the architect, who's the construction manager, it's the students working together. And from what we saw, it is very, very successful. Now, the content of that program is broadly the same as what we have, certainly in the Undergraduate Construction Studies program. I know that uh, there's still architecture, there's still the engineering disciplines, but there is a, a huge amount of collaborative working, cooperative working within that program. And you can see, if you look at the, the, the sort of areas of competence that, that they um, claim to produce graduates with, it's not just design, there's all the technology there, there's the financial commercial aspects, there's the uh, production management aspects, and I think perhaps it could provide us with a potential model uh, if we were looking forward. So the, the, the opening question was, are we fit for purpose? Well, I would suggest that maybe we are fit for the purpose of built environment education as it was, but perhaps not for built environment education as it needs to be in the future. And really that's where Becky comes in because um, the whole Becky initiative is about promoting this idea of collaboration and integration. And we have, we've come up with this um, uh, idea of looking at the life cycle of a building, not in, a, in linear terms, but in a sort of a, uh, an infinite cyclical term. So, looking at it through the design and production stages, but then through the occupation stages, and then later in the life of the building when decisions have to be made about whether we adapt the building, whether we extend it and convert it, or whether we dispose of the building. So, the, uh, the whole idea, as I said, of the, of the Becky Initiative is that we seek to um, get everyone involved. It, it is a, a, a truly sort of collaborative exercise, and, and, and that's what we want to use to not just for research purposes, but to develop our curriculum as well. So, thank you very much. So, no, I don't think it does. So, is there, is there education in other 
was the European Commission going to say? Mirror ours still? Is it still? No, I mean, the, the, as much as ours? In, in most of mainland Europe, um, there seems to be recognition of the disciplines of architecture, obviously, and of engineering, um, and very little in between. But I mean, Colin, you know more about the, the one in the industry in Germany, for example, through your work, Linda. But that, that seems to be the case. I think the, the the Danish thing we found that they were still teaching architecture as a separate and still. Yes. Uh, yes, and but they very design oriented. You know, very yeah. similar to us. I mean, in Denmark, they, they have a, a discipline that's known as the constructing architect. Yeah. And the constructing architect would, would really have the, uh, I suppose the equivalent here, the closest equivalent here, would be a combination of the construction manager, the architectural technologist, the quality surveyor, rolled into one. Um, they don't have that same degree of specialisation. They still have architects who would be responsible for the concept design, and then they would hand it over to a constructing architect who would do everything from there on in, in terms of developing the, uh, the working drawings and taking it forward through the sort of production stages. So that's what that course is, is modeled on. The, the, the Danish model is sounds here really very exciting. Are there students going out and getting jobs? Does it need re-educating employers? Well, I think one of the one of the strands that um, we discussed uh, amongst the, the Becky team is the need not just for, for academic research and not just for curriculum development, but also for engagement with industry to find out, um, you know, we make assumptions that if this is what employers want, but it could well be that when we talk to employers, that they're quite happy to accept these more sort of rounded graduates who, who come from uh, a, a course which is more collaborative. So I think that would be part of our ongoing agenda, really. The, the other interesting thing about Denmark is that they integrate uh, professionals in the examination process, in setting the work, so that when they present their work, they present it not just to the uh, to the academics. They have teams That's right. Yeah. So how do they actually get assessed? Huh? How do they get assessed? What, do what they do exams? They, they, they don't do exams, I'll tell you how they get assessed, and, and this is probably where the, the students that are here might get a little bit scared about this, but uh, they, the students work in groups throughout the whole project. Um, now, we know from our experiences of running group projects that there's a tendency for students within groups to specialise, so they only take responsibility for that bit of the project which um, they, they have to deal with. Our understanding from talking to the staff at, uh, at BIA was that each student has to make an individual presentation to a panel of staff and external visiting, visitors from industry. And they can be quizzed on any aspect of the project. So they have to engage throughout the project with all aspects of it. Because if they don't, they, they, the only assessment they have is that presentation. There's no exam, there's no written work. It is purely based on the, the presentation which students make to the panel at the end. So it's intense pressure and a lot hinges on it, but it, it certainly makes them um, focus. How are the presentations? Well, we, uh, we didn't see any of the presentations, but we do know that they do a, this kind of thing, but they back it up with all of the drawings, all of the costings, yeah. etc. So it looks comprehensive. I mean, as I say, they, they have to bring in the uh, all all the sort of course team and visitors from industry, and they set aside I, I don't know, I, I guess a whole week, I would think, just to do those those presentations. Is, is it worth um, exploring jointly validated courses? I mean, I know at Sheffield they do there's a, an engineering and architecture degree that's sort of validated by both. Accredited <coughs> uh, by both the RIBA and the is it the civil engineers or yeah civil engineers yeah. Um, and that's, is that just is that just more complication or is that kind of well I mean my only experience was uh, of, of this type of thing was in a previous institution I, I worked at and in fact I worked there with with Martin at, at Luton and they they tried to uh, introduce a. Um, a program at Luton where 
architects were actually going to be educated together with construction managers and quality surveyors. And it was going to be the, the future. And it was really through the influence of the professional bodies that um, it became impossible because the RIBA were expecting everything to be delivered through design studios, but then you went to the CIOB or the RICS and they were expecting a certain level of content. And it just became impossible. I mean, was that, would that be your mm. expression, your experience of it as well? Yes. So, I mean, it, it's, it's nice in principle, but when it, when it comes to the reality of, of dealing with professional bodies, I think that uh, there needs to be a change of mindset amongst those people as well. Yeah. I mean, yeah. No, I mean, they always say that, I mean, the RBA, they always claim, in okay. education, they always claim that they are open to discussions and about new ways of new models and what have you. I don't know, maybe it's worth at least having a conversation. Well, absolutely, yeah. I'll, I'm all for that. Yeah. Uh, the, 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 one of the problems with, with integrating engineering into any other is that engineering is, is governed by European requirements. And therefore, it is full of maths and science and the you know, thermodynamics, whatever it is, fluid dynamics. And there's, if you do architecture, you will tend to come, even if you do it with engineering, you come out either as an architect or as an engineer, because you can't do both in time. So I think this model would be best, at least at the beginning, uh, the best approach would be to look at the other areas that we do. And, and that is that great mass of RICSs and yeah. And see it that way and then see how successful yeah. that can be. You know, I wasn't suggesting that, I was just saying that engineering one, I, I know that exists, but I, I know we don't have a civil engineering department there anyway, but I mean... But if you go to Bath, where it's famous for its architecture and engineers, yeah. it actually turns out <coughs> that they're not engineers. They don't recognise this, you know, child. Architects in there, or I've been there. So. Mm. What? No, no. <laughs> yeah, thanks. It's really great and uh, very stimulating. And on, on the screen that we've got collaboration and integration, if it's such a great idea, which it clearly is in many people's minds, it must be a win win situation. In that case, um, who. Um, what, what, are the, uh, what are the implications? If, if it's a win-win situation, then surely everybody would be going for it. Why are the institutions then resisting it? it, it is it not a win-lose situation? If some people win, some people lose. What, what, what's, the, what's the argument then? I think from the institution's perspective, uh, they're, they're all competing with each other. And they're all, uh, they're big businesses now, aren't they? Uh, they the RICS is a, is a global organisation. With, with 120, 140,000 members or something, and a huge turnover which runs to tens of millions, hundreds of millions of pounds each year. So they, they might want to do anything which uh, uh, affects their, their position, and they, they will all see themselves as the, uh, the, the principal um, contact within the industry, uh, and they won't want to give up anything which affects their status. So I think that the institutions are perhaps at the at the root of it. Can I also, I think an answer to that as well. But to some extent, uh, it's not always about conflict between the institutions. There's a thing about excellence, design excellence, in all those levels that uh, the institutes are there to promote, actually. I think the, you know, the Britain has, a, uh, has produced has a, a excellence in architecture, in design, we have a fantastic, and we've got excellence in engineering. Now, the, what in the end we're going to have to fight against is that balance between cooperation, which I'm absolutely for, as you know, because I'm supporting that mix, but also not to lose the astonishing excellence that we have. I, I can talk, I think, about it as a designer a little bit, but as an engineer too, we have that. So you have to balance those two things out. It's not always about people's, that f you call it fragmentation, it could also be called specialisation. So it, we need to be. I think we do both things. In the I mean, I think that fragmentation and specialisation are perhaps two sides of the same yeah, coin. Exactly. But as you say, there, there's, there, there's a balance there somewhere. Well, that's why the kind of construction uh, thing, sort of the centre of it, could be the 
thing that kind of connects the two. Because it, that isn't also excellent in terms of the way that things are executed. Or certainly from the perspective of the designer, or they remove from it the process of construction. That isn't good, that isn't, you know, there's not a good argument for that. So I think the idea of making that better I'm actually kind of. Yeah. Well, let's say that, that could, be our, could be our starting point, and then that provides the bridge then to, to some further developments down the line. Um, I think what you said about um, no company wants to give up their status, yeah, I think that's what it boils down to. If you've got something, you're not gonna, if you've got something good, you're not going to want to give it up unless you got unless you can exchange it for something better. I'm not too sure what is better, but um, from a student's perspective, I think that um, I like the Danish model. But the only thing I didn't like was that what you said about the presentations as an assessment. So I don't think it would be fair that it all comes down to ten minutes, because some people might not be able to um, uh, do as well on like ten minutes as a, in like a ten minute assessment as opposed to like a written assessment or something. Yeah, I mean, if, if we were to go down that sort of route, we wouldn't necessarily have to slavishly follow the, the Danish model, but it would be a model as a, as a starting point, and then we'd have to sort of you know, look at the, the overall assessment processes to, to make sure that we are assessing all of the, the, um, the, the learning outcomes associated with what we want to achieve. No, I think if the first year was more like theory-based, then um, it give everyone like a more level playing field, that like everyone would have a knowledge base of the industry, and then maybe second and third year can be more like project. I'm, I'm, I'm not convinced about that. I mean, uh, we could have we could go on all day about this, but I think that as soon as you if you if you embed a culture in the first year of the course, then it's very difficult for students to actually get out of that in the second year. Yeah. They become used to a theory based course in the first year. They will really rail against any. Uh, deviation from that model in the second year, I, in my opinion. I don't know what anyone else thinks about that. But. That's what we do at the moment, really, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. We're the architect students here. But if, uh, we got, yeah, we've got, we've got it's interesting you say that because they get trained early on to have to stand up and make public presentations. It's part of the kind of, the crit system is part of our thing. And some people really don't enjoy it and never really get used to it. And, and I think that's a fair point that you need to be be able to do both. Some people are happier yeah. to putting paper in than having to stand up. And that works. So it's a very common. Okay. Sorry, yeah, I'm, I'm a part time student and uh, I think I've benefited immensely from being in the situation where I study at work because it's been fantastic. Um, how does the Danish system incorporate part time students? Well, that, that's a very good point actually because when, when I've been, you know, go, this has been going over in my mind that uh, we, we have a very strong part time element to our programme. And I think that the, the Danish model works primarily with full-time students who are going to be in, you know, three or four days a week probably working on these projects. I don't think it works in the same way for part-time students. And, and my, my initial view on that would be that we would have to maintain a, a part-time group separate and perhaps delivered under a, a different process. But I, I think you've, you've sort of, you've hit a very personal point there. Yeah, I think it's, you know, it's just been a fantastic experience. Uh, I'll be interested to hear the views of other students on, on that Danish model, how they would respond to it. Yeah, and don't, and don't, don't be fooled, it's not 10 minutes. Do you know what I mean? It's a, they get lots yeah. of time. It's more fairly assessed. And, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it, it, it. I think the Is that with this process of having to present the entire pitch, 
then from the very beginning, people realize they can't just let other people do the work. So, so at the, at, as Tony was saying, you've embedded a culture at the, the, the start point where they know they're there to work, you know, and to play a, an active role. So it, it has all sorts of potential, you know, very interesting group dynamics. And they have a lot. They spend a lot of time working on how the, the groups work. Um, no, I mean, no, 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 no. You want to say that? I made that. Sorry. <laughs> I mean, that was like two weeks ago, and it destroyed me. Just say it again. And where do you put our, where do you put our idea? Why, why do you put our? I said, how many of us 
you know, are actually RLBA members, a lot of the staff and so on, and about half were and half weren't actually. But then they said, well, the perception of the public is, and if you haven't got that RIBA up there, you're not an architect sort of thing. So your perception is exactly what we all suffer from, yeah. if you like. So I think it's a very good place to, but don't worry about it. We can done it. <laughs> 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 yeah, that's good. Okay. Uh, I mean, part, part of the question would be, if you're coming out and, and you've got <coughs> skills to, to use the latest technology and stuff like that, and can command the highest salary, but you don't have the title, what do you want? Yeah. yeah? And, and I think that potentially, if you look at some of, some of the graduates that are coming out that can use the, the latest technology and stuff like that, that are able to command a much higher salary, then maybe there's something in that, because that potentially does away with that. But what, what Pete's saying is absolutely right. Half the challenge here is if you're going to set yourself up as an independent, yeah, and wanting to sell your services, then you will also have to project something. Okay. Well, oh, very good. And the interface of industry. And I think that's you know, where Becky sits very comfortably. 
and where the kind of talks we've had you know, shed very interesting light on new ways in which we can build those dialogues. And maybe the way around it is maybe project plays, maybe introducing other kinds of uh, courses that not only are pan professional and cross disciplinary in terms of academic terms, but roping in industry as well, you know, roping in the construction industry as well. I think that's kind of fundamentally important. And I think the area you can do that is this kind of space between academia and industry, which is probably my you know, particular interest, as somebody's going kind to of probably work between the two a little bit. Um, but I'm chuffed that uh, the Becky boys and uh, ably led by Sue and supported Sue and another, another supported by Jane and uh, you know yeah, uh, whipped into shape in the fourth point months and we're all looking forward to that by by Lucy and, and, and I think there's you know there's great potential in this so I'm I'm, I'm delighted it's it's happening in a small way and thank you all for attending and supporting it. We look forward to future events. Thank you. Thank you.